Hello everyone, um, I'm Larissa with United Natural Products Alliance and I just wanted to share with you um, some of our key um, highlights to a report that was issued yesterday by the FDA. The report was issued to the U.S. House Committee on Appropriations and to the U.S. Senate Committee on Appropriations and the title is long but stick with me, Sampling Study of the Current Cannabidiol Marketplace to Determine the Extent that Products are Mislabeled or Adulterated. So what I wanted to cover with you today is really just some quick comments regarding my interpretation of the 2020 data. The report does include additional information um, on historical data that dates back to 2014 through 2018, but I'm not gonna cover that today. So this report has probably been all over your social media today. It was signed by Dr. Hahn, who's the commissioner of the FDA. And the commissioner has um, shared with us um, the data and some um, background information related to what FDA was kind of focusing on um, related to this report. And as you all recall, this report was kind of inspired by the public meeting and by some con congressional direction given to the FDA. So first point that sticks out to me is that uh, the, title, the title is very interesting. Can, um, it says, Sampling Study of the Current Navidadial Marketplace. And what surprised me is that I thought from attending public meetings that this was more for hemp extracts and hemp products, and not only on cannabidiol, which is CBD, which is only one constituent within the hemp plant. So I felt like it was very narrow focus for the title. With um, that, I wanted to share with you um, the data. Again, I'm only looking at the 2020 data, but when we look at this um, set of information, it's evaluating um, 147 products. But when you looked at products specific to the CBD, Content, there was 138 products were, that were being um, tested. And of those that claimed to have CBD in the product, only two of them failed to include the constituents. So now no failure is ever good, but when we do a failure percentage, um, this is way less than 1%. It's actually 0.014%. Um, so in the big picture, it's actually not as bad as I was expecting. Um, when I have been working with hemp companies, um, I have found that stability data is still um, pretty um, slim, and that's because we only have had since December to um, legally work with these products. So um, we don't have a full 12 months of stability data yet, so I wasn't sure what to expect. And ultimately, I think that data um, actually looks pretty good. So when we talk about hemp products and any dietary supplement products, um, from a product development standpoint, which is part of my background, finished products are hard to stabilize when you're talking about vitamins and botanical constituents. It's especially in some of the matrix that were included in the report. Um, this report included gummies, soft gels, um, they call it edibles, which I'm guessing is gonna be foods. And surprisingly, there was only one product that was incorporated that was a, a capsule, which would be the, the easiest to work with and the most stable. So um, I guess in the bigger picture, just think about it, um, supplements typically are a lot harder to stabilize. So of these products, 82% of the products were tinctures and oils, 17 of them were gummies, and eight of them were beverages. So we, um, overall, let's talk through the concentration or the composition. Now, one thing to think about is that the ranges that were given for the concentrations is they were really allowing they put it into buckets of 20% um, over the label claim, 20% um, plus or minus label claim, meaning um, um, let's call that loosely um, the acceptable range. And then they had products that were 20% um, outside of that, what I'm calling acceptable range, so um, less than label claim. So of those, we have 18% of the products that were less than label claim, 45 of the products, 45% mm -hmm. of the products, excuse me, were within that wide range of um, plus or minus 20%, and 37% were more than the label claim. So if you think about the GMPs, products are allowed to have over the label claim, um, especially when we're talking about vitamins and botanical constituents that we know will degrade over time. This is called intentional, um, um, it's intentional overage, and it's included in your master manufacturing records. And what 
cross formulas we'll, we'll be considering is what do they need to be 100% of label claim at the time of expiration? So you kind of formulate around that number and you would again incorporate it into your master manufacturing record. As an investigator for the FDA, what, what I would have been looking for is, is that overage justified? And based on the amount of overage, is it dangerous or toxic? So that is really where we're looking at mega doses for water soluble vitamins. So again, we're gonna focus in on um, these are outside of a typical range. They're much broader ranges. So what I call the acceptable criteria is really plus or minus 20%. So FDA would allow um, some mm. variation based on naturally occurring constituents in a botanical product. And if we look at the dietary supplement compendium, the USP dietary supplement compendium, many of those um, monographs allow for variation of 90 to 110%. So think of that when you're looking at these, um, in the, the data inside of this. Some of our science and technology partners, I'd like to uh, ask them to help look through this information and see if we can find additional information related to the method that was used. I think that's um, one of my questions. What is the variability of the method? And really, as the method that was utilized, um, is it validated for all of these matrix? Because again, a lot of these are difficult to analyze. So the last piece I wanted to talk to you about is um, contaminants. And it's mentioned in the report several um, contaminants. And I'm going to call THC a contaminant because we incorporated that in our food safety plan for hemp as a potential contaminant. The reason for that is that in the 2018 Farm Bill, it defines hemp specifically um, as containing less than 0.3% THC. So that's how it differentiates from marijuana. THC is a naturally occurring constituent in both plants, but again, that's uh, um, specific hemp products. Um, the table for 2020 um, describes the, pr um, the presence of THC, but it doesn't really reference whether this is a good or bad thing. But I just wanted to raise um, to everyone's attention that if you have a simple extract and that you're not manipulating the extract, because if you did, that would make it a new dietary ingredient, that you would expect to find some percentage of THC in that product. So those are my highlights, my high points. If you have any questions, um, please reach out to us. We'd be happy to help. I do encourage you to spend some time on this. This is a product category of interest to you. It's a short read, it's about eight pages, um, but I've only covered a brief section, which is the 2020 data. So with that, I want to thank you for listening. Have a fantastic day. And if you're an NPA member, we want to thank you for your membership um, and let us know how we can help. Thank you, Larissa. That was great. Um, please stay tuned. We will be sharing a lot of videos and highlights on all the hot topics. So if you have not subscribed to our YouTube channel, make sure you do. And make sure you're following us on social media. But we are here to help and happy to serve. Thanks, guys.